We have been talking about God's kingdom coming into our lives, and uh, it has been a phenomenal series, and I can say that because um, half of it was not done by me. It was done by uh, Randy and Brian, and they did a fantastic job talking about kingdom conflict and the causes of the kingdom, creating an environment in the kingdom to be able to expand. And so, uh, man, it's just been good. But over the past couple of weeks, we've talked about being a citizen in the kingdom. We've talked about the rights and privileges of the kingdom, the conditions, environment of the kingdom. We've talked about the cause of the kingdom. If you've missed any of those four so far, um, they are available on social media and online. I would definitely challenge you to go back and catch some of those um, so that you are caught up to uh, speed today. But my goal today is to put a bow on this thing, kind of package it together, finish it up. We're going to go to a new series next week called The One Who Is Your One. And we're going to be talking about one person um, that, that we are reaching for the gospel of Jesus Christ as we build toward um, Easter. Easter is going to be a phenomenal event around here. If you guys do not know, it's a horrible analogy, but it's the best one I can think of. Uh, for the church, Easter is basically our Super Bowl. Like, it is it. Like, it's the day that Jesus Christ defeated death, hell, and the grave, and we are going to celebrate it with all we've got. Three services are going to be packed. Um, it's going to be an amazing, amazing weekend, and we want to challenge you to think of someone who needs to be here and be a part of that over the next couple of weeks. But today, we're going to close this out. We're going to do it like we have every single one of these um, one of these messages. So this is the last one. We're going to do this with all of our hearts. So I want you to pray this prayer, the Lord's Prayer, with me. And we're going to have it on the screen for you. You ready? Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Everybody say amen. amen. Come on, give God some praise today. Wow. In Matthew 11, verse 12, Jesus says this, the kingdom suffers violence and the violent take it by force. What he's talking about there is not that we take it by force, but that there are pressures from the outside attempting to try to take the kingdom of God from us. And so in the kingdom, there is violence, and there is an enemy that is opposed to the kingdom that is trying to take that kingdom away from us. Pastor Jeremy Foster from Houston, Texas says this, every acre of kingdom advancement will be met with another Fight, meaning every time you stretch, every time you make a commitment to go deeper in God, the enemy will bring a new attack in your life. In the old school, we used to say another level, another devil. Here's the good thing, though. For every advancement that you take, for every level that you go, not only is there another devil, another attack, but there is also a fresh new anointing and level of God's grace for your life to be able to defend and be victorious over the enemy. So today what I want to do is I want to identify the ways in which the enemy always attacks. He's very predictable. There are three ways that the enemy always attacks that we're going to talk about that he tries to come in and take the kingdom out of your life. This violence that comes in to destroy the kingdom the way in which it is. Because some of you guys have made commitments this year. We're finishing up the first quarter of 2019. So if you're in business, it's going to be a busy week for you. If you, um, if you are in church world, we're three weeks to Easter, so stuff's starting to get crazy. If you are in, in, in the school world, you're about six weeks away from summer. And so the teachers are all getting excited and the parents are all getting worried. <laughs> so the kids all have mixed messages. Should we be happy about this or what's going on? This stuff happened. Transition. That's what happens in, in the spring. We're transitioning from um, this cold weather, rainy, nasty winter we've had. Not a very pretty winter at all, just nasty and rain. We're transitioning now into some nice warm weather with the exception of tomorrow because it's Arkansas. And Arkansas has to throw one more little curveball in just to make you, sure you bring all your plants in real good. And, 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 and we're going to, in just about two months, we're going to be griping that it's too hot. And then we wishing it was cold again. But for the next couple of weeks, we, we get this nice transition weather. We get this, this nice season. At the beginning of this year, before the transition, we made commitments. Some of you guys made tithing challenges, and you stepped out and said, man, I'm going to tithe. I'm going to do what God's called me to do in my giving. And then all of a sudden, you got hit with an attack. Or maybe you said, I'm going to give my life to Christ for the very first time, and maybe you were baptized at the end of January, and 
February 1st, you got hit with an attack. Maybe, maybe it was a physical attack or a financial attack or emotional or maybe even a spiritual attack. But, but there are some stuff, some things in your life, there are some things in your life that are absolutely worth fighting for. Let me say it again. There are some things in your life that are worth fighting for. So there is an enemy that is coming in to steal, kill, and destroy. There is an enemy that is coming in with violence to attack you because you got a bullseye on your back because you said, now I belong to Christ. You thought it was going to be easy when you came to Christ. You thought everything was going to be fine and you're going to drive a Cadillac tomorrow morning and your house payment would be taken care of and your, your husband would no longer be a jerk and your kids wouldn't be rebellious and everything would be wonderful and then you woke up and life still happens. You might know what I'm talking about. I was talking to somebody last night, and they were saying that, you know, they're trying to find out what, what God's trying to do in this situation. I said, sometimes life just sucks, and what's behind it is suck. There's a PG on the screen everyone before service on purpose. Sometimes there is no hidden meaning. Sometimes it's just these, the kingdom suffers violence, and the violent try to take it from your life by force. Sometimes it just stinks. But if we can identify and understand that what the enemy does every single time is a very simple formula that he never veers from. In thousands of years, he's never veered from this formula. So much so that in theology, excuse me, in mythology, I said the same thing first service, but in mythology, not theology, because it's not accurate, it's just myth, there is a symbol to define this fight they it, it's called the hounds of hell anybody ever heard of the hounds of hell devil dog maybe if you've watched um uh harry potter his name's fluffy um it's a three-headed beast or animal that has been defined in mythology as cerberus in fact we've got a picture of him if you want to see him he's quite attractive fluffy's not a good name for him now tell me that doesn't scare you to death But throughout all of history, the enemy is attacked in the same three ways. So much so that if you research, you can do a Google search, it'll take you about 30 seconds. You can do it right now if you want to. I won't be offended. A little bit, but not a lot. And you can go back and you see, if you put Cerberus, ancient pictures of Cerberus, you will find pictures from thousands of years ago to define the three-headed beast that represents the attack of the enemy. Why? Because he's always attacked the same way. And if we can understand the attack of the enemy... We can begin to defeat the enemy because we neutralize the weapon. You can take that off. People are going to have nightmares already. We've got people already <laughs> nervous and scared to death, but it's not an image you're going to easily forget, I promise. But when that image comes to mind. What I want you to do is I want you to break down those three heads. And so we're going to take each one of these heads, three attacks, three heads of the enemy. You can write these down, do whatever you want, but man, I would challenge you to take these with you because when we identify these three heads, we are no longer at the mercy of their power. We can identify and neutralize them because you can now see, you can put shape to the attack of the enemy and what you are feeling internally from each of these attacks, now you have the ability to put a handle on it and you can get a grip on it. So the first and most common attack from the enemy, the center head of Cerberus is this, the enemy is fear. The, the, the picture of service is designed to inflict fear. That's, that's the whole point of it. In fact, if the enemy can bring fear into your life, he paralyzes you before you start. The best way to defeat an enemy is to get them before they begin. So if you want somebody to be neutralized, you neutralize them before they start to fight. Because then everything is resolved and there never has to be any kind of conflict. It's done. So fear, this scary image, this thing, is exactly designed to do that. It is to stop you before you even begin. It comes to paralyze you so that you do not even attempt your dream, your purpose, or your destiny. I love this statement. Fear is a climate closing in. It's like a fog in San Francisco or London. It's nowhere in particular and yet everywhere at the same time. Fear is like the haze that is on this stage during worship. You can see it when the lights are shining through, but you can't feel it. You can't touch it. If you tried to grab it, your hands go straight through it. That is what fear is like. You lay awake at night, and you are gripped by fear, but you can't seem to grasp it or touch it. You feel the pressure, the weight, the surrounding of fear, but you don't have the ability to defend yourself against fear in the natural 
In politics, it's called the war of the nerves. If your opponent can attack you with enough vigor and enough strength, with enough uh, um, threat, with a, enough attack ads or whatever it is, whatever medium that they're using at that moment from social media to traditional marketing, if they can do it enough, it will put you in a place of fear to where you literally have a nervous collapse and you will cower in fear. And if they can do that, they win before the election even starts. Because you'll fear for failure, you'll fear for embarrassment, you'll fear for loss, you'll fear for pain, you'll fear for shame, fear. I'm not going to ask anybody in this room how many people have been afraid at one time or another because everybody in this room has been attacked by fear because the number one first weapon that the enemy always uses every single time is fear. Fear is the enemy of faith. Fear is the enemy of faith. Fear is the invisible wall that cages you in and keeps you in a prison cell of your own making. Fear attacks by putting artificial limitations that restrict our freedom of movement and blessing and our, our employment or our relationships or our ability to see beyond where we are right now. Fear. Every area of life is affected by fear if we allow it. Now, there's good kinds of fear. For those of you that are more like thrill seekers and, and you like roller coasters and you like adrenaline junkie kind of stuff, there's a roller coaster in Williamsburg, Virginia, at Bush Gardens also in, in Florida. It's called the Griffith in, um, in Virginia. It, it's one of the tallest roller coasters in North America and is the tallest with what they call an inverted drop. Anybody know what an inverted drop is? It's where you get to the top and instead of it going down on a slope, you go down on a slope but the slope is literally upside down. And you're still doing the free fall from about 250 feet in the air, but you're doing it while hanging in a free fall. Now, the first time I did it, I remember having a nervous breakdown, heart attack, heart failure, congestive heart failure, hypertension, bloating. Um, <laughs> it was, you know, if I knew somebody was pregnant or was pregnant or thought about getting pregnant, I shouldn't ride this ride. But we went on it anyway, and the reason I went on it was because I was shamed into it, quite honestly, because I'm a grown man, and I was taking a bunch of teenagers to Bush Gardens who were like, we're going to ride it, we're going to ride it. I was like, you're, you're good. I'm your youth pastor. I need to live. i got to drive you home. So until this about 15-year-old girl who was about this tall walked up and said, Pastor James, are you scared? <laughs> now, the honest answer would have been, why, yes, I am. I'm also an adult. I'm good. But what I did instead was, scared of nothing. I rode the ride. I rode it eight times after that because it was amazing. Good fear. Because what they do is 250 feet in the air, they take you up and they hold you in an inverted hang for eight seconds. Which eight seconds right now, we can count to eight. It's not a big deal. But when you're hanging 250 feet in the air and you can see from Virginia, Florida, <laughs> like I was waving at you all curvature of the earth, the whole thing. I mean, it was fear-inducing because you're anticipating the drop. You see, that's what fear does in our life because the other kind of fear is not so fun, but it's still anticipating the drop. It's anticipating the next shoe to drop. It's anticipating what's coming next. It's anticipating what's going to happen tomorrow. And if the enemy can bring fear into your life and he can destroy you with fear, he will absolutely derail your future. And if he can derail your future, he has you before you begin. So how do we defeat fear? 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7 says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. Luke 12, 32 says, Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Now listen to me. We have talked for four weeks about the kingdom, about the things of the kingdom, the rights and privileges of the kingdom, citizenship within the kingdom. Everything there, it is God's good pleasure to give you. God's desire is to bless you. It is God's desire to give you the things of the kingdom. But sometimes we allow fear to come into our life. 1 John 4, 4 says, You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them because of the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. So here's what we've got to understand, that when fear comes in, it is an absolute attack of the enemy. It is an absolute way to derail our future and even our present. And if he can get a hold of us and we bind ourselves by fear then we put ourselves in a position where we do not understand the word of God for our life that says that he is greater 
than the one who is against us. So how do we fix this? Romans 10.10, for it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. In other words, sometimes we've got to start saying some things that are not. In the middle of the night, maybe you've got to look a little crazy and start talking to the fear and start letting the fear know what, the, what faith says. Let fear know what the Bible says. Let fear knows, know what God says. Verse 13, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? How can they believe in one in whom they've not heard? How can they hear without someone preaching to them? Stop just for a second. Whether it's me, whether it's Randy, whether it's Tina, whether it's Brian, whether it's my wife, whoever it is that happens to be up here, Pastor Paul, whoever it is that is speaking the word of God in your life, listen to me very carefully. You cannot overcome fear without the word of God, but you can't hear the word of God unless somebody tells you the word of God. That means you got to pay attention. you got to listen. you got to be able to, to get it. Some of you guys come and you're like, man, I come to kind of church because the worship's great, and that's wonderful, and it's a part of it, and it creates environment, and we do hear the word of God through the singing. We are very careful to make sure the songs that, we, that, that are chosen are correct theologically, that the message that is being sent is correct. But, but when you tone out during the message... And you say, you know what, I don't really, I'm, I'm just not here for that. I'm just here because of the music. You are missing the power of God in your life to be able to overcome the enemy that wants to come in to steal, kill, and destroy. And you are absolutely at his mercy because you've not heard the word of God. You don't have faith. You say, well, Pastor James, I don't have faith. I can tell you what you're listening to. You know every single word to every Toby Keith song. But you have no idea what Jesus said. Faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. How can they preach unless they've been sent out? Beautiful are the feet, people who bring the good news. Consequently, faith comes by hearing, hearing the message. And the message is heard through the word about Christ. The first weapon of the enemy is fear. But the way that we conquer it is through the word. We are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus, our Lord. We're going to come back to that conquering in just a second. I'm going to identify the second head of this hound from hell, the second enemy, and that is deception. Deception. So if he cannot freeze you with fear, he will talk you out of your dream. John 8, 44, he, talking about the devil, this is what Jesus said, was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language. For he is a liar and the father of lies. So if the enemy is speaking to you, he is lying. Every time. No matter what he says. If it's coming out of his mouth, his native language is a lie. He cannot speak the truth if he wants to speak the truth. Everything he says is a lie. Because the enemy cannot meet you on equal terms. Because there, are, there is no equality between Satan and God. Some of us think we've got our theology from TV too long, and we see the devil on one side and the little angel on the other side, and they're whispering, it, and we think, you know, it's, it's good versus evil, it's light versus darkness, it's God versus Satan, and all of that is absolutely fabricated by the enemy to put him on an equal playing field with God. There is no equal playing field. The Bible says that I saw a, a war in heaven. There was, this, there was this coup in heaven, and Satan got all these angels together. He said, we're going to overthrow God. And, and, and like just immediately after that, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. That's how long it lasted. Like, war in heaven. Oh, it's over. Like, CNN wouldn't be able to get to it. Like, we're breaking this. Oh, never mind. Sorry. Like, go back to your TV station, whatever you were watching. It's over. Why? Because there's no equality there. The enemy tries to come in. The enemy tries to steal, kill, and destroy. And God says, no, it's over. That's it. But if he can deceive you to thinking that he still has power and control, if he can deceive you into thinking that the scale is tipped in his favor, if he can get you to thinking through the fear that he's already brought in your life, or if he has to go beyond the fear to this complete and absurd lie that he makes up, that you're not going to be something, that God doesn't want something good for your life, then he starts to put you in a position where he can now control you. In, Ma or, excuse me, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, that's exactly what he did at the very beginning. 
The Bible says he looked at Eve and he said, did God really say? Like God told Adam and Eve, here's what I want to do. You guys are amazing. You're the first creation. You have anything here. Don't touch this tree. This tree you don't want to eat. It's nasty anyway. It's like a persimmon. It's not right. You you don't want to eat that. Just the rest of them, everything's good. Satan walks up to Eve and goes, did God really say like you, you can't eat that? And because Eve did not remember the word of God, she misquoted the word of God and said, not only did he say we can't, he said, you can't even touch it. You know the problem with that statement? Is she automatically assumed at that point, and the enemy jumped all over it, that God was withholding something good from her. You see, the deception of the enemy is this. God doesn't want you to have fun. God doesn't want you to do that because that he knows you'll just enjoy that way too much. Oh, God's telling you to give that up for that season, or God's telling you not to do that because he, does, he just doesn't understand that what you want to do is so much fun and it's going to be so great, and he doesn't want your dreams to be accomplished. He doesn't want you to be everything you've been called to be. He wants you to be under his control, and he spins the word of God so that you don't understand anymore that God is for you and not against you, and God wants you blessed and not cursed, and God wants you to fulfill the dream and purpose and destiny that he's put you in the earth for today. Every single person that is here right now, God has formed you and put you in this place for such a time as this. But the enemy says, no, 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 no. God's trying to keep something good from you. And we buy it because we don't know the word of God. But look what Jesus did with the exact same accusations in Matthew chapter 4. The enemy comes in and says, hey, if you'll fall down and worship me, I'll put, the, I'll put the kingdoms of the world at your feet. Now he's assuming that Jesus doesn't realize that the kingdoms of the world are already at his feet. Hey, if you'll put yourself up on this pinnacle and you'll cast yourself down, you'll be risen back up and people will see it. And it's going to be an amazing thing. He didn't realize that Jesus was already planning on doing that. But he twisted. And what was Jesus' response every time? It is written well he was jesus he ought to know the word he is the word like he should know that right but we've been made in the image of god we've been called to be christ-like christians followers of christ that means our job is to know the word of god that means when the enemy comes in and says did god really say you're going to be blessed we can say not only did he say i was going to be blessed he said i was going to do exceeding abundantly above all that i could ask or even think why because it's written in the word of god So when the enemy comes in and tries to bind you with fear, what breaks the back of fear is the word of God. When the enemy comes in and tries to deceive you and lie to you, what breaks the back of deception is the word of God. Because if he cannot scare scare the hell out of you, he'll lie to you. Anybody know somebody like that? Hmm. He will resort to any level of dishonesty necessary to deceive you to control you, and to defeat you. During his life, Gandhi wrote a letter to Mary Lester. Mary Lester was a famous Baptist missionary that was probably one of the very first, if not the first, um, kind of human trafficking freedom fighters. She took 60 orphans from China who were being put in slavery, and she smuggled them out of the country. She was nominated for two Nobel Peace Prizes. Um, This is a letter that he wrote to her. He said, speak the truth without fear and without exception. See everyone whose work is related to your purpose. You are God's work, so you do not need to fear man's scorn. If they listen to your request and grant them, you'll be satisfied. If they reject them, then you must make their rejection your strength. Here's what he said. Speak the truth. The truth about you is that you are called to do what you've been called to do. And when somebody agrees with you, whether they do or not, great. And if they don't, Use their disagreement as your strength, but move right on forward. Because the enemy is going to come in and tell you that you cannot do something. But deception is nothing more than the enemy of truth. So by knowing the truth, you destroy the attack of the enemy. You are God's child. You are blessed and not cursed. You are the top and not the bottom. The head and not the tail. The front and not the back. Jesus' response to deception. It is written. Proverbs 23, 23. By the truth. And sell it not. Third head, third weapon is hatred. Hatred. 
So the enemy will come in and try to cause you fear. If you do not fall to fear, then he will lie to you and deceive. This is the way he's done it for thousands of years. This is the way it's been depicted throughout all of mythology and theology. It has not changed, not once. The enemy is very much not creative. So when you see this big model begin to happen in your life, when you start to see fear, you overcome the fear. Know that there's going to be a second weapon. That second weapon is deception. When deception doesn't work, there's going to be a third weapon. That third weapon is hatred. What is hatred? It is isolation and separation. What does hatred do? It causes the power of agreement to be broken in your life. It causes you to be in a place where you are isolated and alone. And so like a pack on the Serengeti as the lion or the lioness starts to come in and go after the wildebeest or after the gazelle or whatever it is that they happen to be chasing at that moment, they're not trying to go after the pack. They try to scare the pack to get the pack moving so that inevitably something will be left behind. And what do they go after every time? The young, the old, the weak, the one that is not, not well, the one that's got a bad leg, the one that is left behind, that is isolated from the pack. If he cannot scare you, if he cannot deceive you, he will draw you away from, he will draw lines between you and someone else. Because the Bible says that he grows about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Without relationship, there cannot be agreement. Paul made reference to it, Matthew 18, 19, when two of you get together on anything at all on earth and make a prayer of it, my Father in heaven goes into action. When two or three of you are together because of me, you can be sure that I'll be there. What is the converse of that? If you don't have agreement, prayer is not answered. If you don't have agreement, God's not there. That's why I believe 100% and fully... And I argue with people all the time, debate it. Excuse me, we don't argue. We debate. You don't argue in church, ever. Don't do that. It's more polite to debate things. But I don't believe that you can be saved and not have a church. Because there is no agreement. You're not part of the body. You're separated. You're on your own. You've got to have people that are around you to hold you up, to be part of your body with you, to lift you up, to encourage you, to be around you. People say, well, I, you know, I just go to church at home, and it's by myself, and it's me and Jesus. Good for you. Bad, bad grammar and theology. Because that's not how God works. God works through agreement and community. God works through a body. He works through a vine and branches. He works through an army. He works through all of these analogies, the family of God that, that, that espouse community and relationship. That's why being in church is so important, guys. Because by yourself, the pack is moving and you're left exposed and separate. You're left on your own. Hatred is hard to define, but it is easy to describe. It begins when a situation where there's first contact without relationship. Social media today has become the cesspool of this description. It used to be if I disagreed with you and Corbett and I were having a disagreement, we'd have to talk through it because I may see him tomorrow and we still got to be friends. You go to somebody at work and you have a disagreement with them and you guys get on this, this argument or whatever, you understand that there's a personal relationship at stake and tomorrow morning we still got to work together. So you figure out a way to express your opinion in a way that still values the person, right? You all look at me like I'm crazy. Are we that far gone as a society? Because what we do on social media is we do a drive-by. We drop in the fact that everything about this person is stupid, they're an idiot, they're a moron. And we don't care. Why? Because I'm never going to see them anyway. I've never met them. Why? We, we, we have connection with no relationship. That's what's caused the divide in our entire country right now. Is we have social media. We are more connected than we've ever been in society, but we have no relationship. Some of y'all text your kids when they're across the room from you. They haven't heard your voice in months. Unless it's you talking into your phone to send them a text. And they're sitting across from you. Why? Because we have connection with no relationship. Connection without relationship is a breeding ground for hatred, division, separation. So what has the enemy done in our life? Society, church, relationships, schools. He tried fear. It hasn't worked. He's tried deception. It's worked to a certain extent. So now what's he doing to our country right now? 
hatred. If I can destroy people, if I can destroy churches, because somebody got their something out of joint a little bit, and instead of having relationship and communication, hatred, separation. If I can separate, if I can cause the crowd to keep moving, that's, I'm okay with that. I'm okay that the church is advancing. I'm okay with the church moving because I'm okay with just picking off one. I'm okay with just getting the one because the enemy knows if I can get the one, I can get two. If I can get two, I can get four. He's not worried about trying to go after everybody. He goes after the one, which is where we've got to be in the church, by the way. We've got to stop worrying about whether or not we're going to get thousands. Let's figure out how to get one more out of hell. Let's figure out how to reach one more person in Hot Springs so that they're not going to be bound by sin and depression and fear and divisiveness and deception. Let's reach one more with the gospel of Jesus Christ. But modern life is so impersonal that this opportunity for the seeds of hatred grows almost undisturbed. And in some cases, celebrated. But it is a work of the enemy. I talked to a guy this week who was talking about how much he hated a friend of mine. And he was just going on and on about it. And I asked him, why did you hate him? He gave me these reasons why. And I'm like, well, he's really not you know, that bad. Like, he's got his quirks, I guess, but he's all right. And the guy made this statement to me. He said, had we met under different circumstances, I might actually like him. Which means his hatred had nothing to do with reality. It had to do with the perception of a meeting of a moment. Isn't that how we are? The enemy comes in, brings fear. That doesn't work because we're overcomers and we know the word of God. He brings deception and we say, man, I got it. I'm speaking truth. But then all of a sudden somebody comes in and they, we don't have a relationship with them. We don't have that context. And something just sets us off. And we're not thinking about it. We don't see it. We don't recognize it for what it is. And we draw a line in the sand. We separate ourselves. No more agreement. No more connection. No more community. No more relationship. It can happen in an individual, it can happen in a family, it can happen in a church, it can happen in a society. I can tell you people after people after people that got mad in church, got hurt at church, I'm never going back, took their family, left church, and generations are affected because they allowed the enemy to come in with hatred, bitterness, this seed, this root. Oh, hatred is so, that's a big word, Pastor James. We don't use the word hate. We just, we were offended. Whatever word you want to use, it's a seed of hatred. It's a seed of hatred. We used to have a society that was convicted. Now we have a society that is offended. It, it, it used to be that the Spirit of God came in and brought conviction. Now it brings offense. Because we can't possibly be wrong. For God to come in and tell me I'm wrong, how, how offensive is that? God doesn't love me. Yeah, he loves you so much that he's trying to make us better. He's trying to keep us out of the weapons of the enemy because hatred ultimately is the enemy of love. Sincerity in human relationships is equal to and the same as sincerity to God. Man's relationship to man, man's relationship to God are one relationship. Here's how Jesus said it, Matthew 25. Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Jesus rejected hatred, not because he didn't have the vitality or the strength, but because he really just lacked the incentive. He realized what hatred was and what hatred would do, and he was not going to fall for it. So what's the answer? Is leave your plays unless you guys think I'm closing. The answer is we've got to know the truth. The answer is we've got to know the original. We pastored in Washington, D.C. for a little while. We have people there that work for the Department of Treasury, also known as the Secret Service. And everybody, when you say Secret Service, you think of protecting people of importance, right? You think the President, Congress, visiting dignitaries, whatever. We had a guy that was in our church, very, very, very large, intimidating guy. And he wore this big ring, looked like a championship football ring word all the time. I walked up to him one day because I thought maybe he played football because he was big enough to have played football. And I walked up and said, dude, your ring is amazing. Like, what, what is that? Tell me about your ring. He said, it's my eagle ring. I'm like, that's kind of cool. What's an eagle ring? 
He goes, it's from when I was on the president's detail. He said, I was the one that walked by the limousine. He said, sometimes I was in the tactical vehicle that nobody sees, but we've got a 50 caliber pointed out the back of it. He said, sometimes I was completely invisible in the crowd, but I was on the eagle detail. He was on the eagle detail for the last term of the Clintons going in for Bush. And he was talking about things that happened and just some cool stories, amazing stuff, going into Rwanda and different places and all the stuff they had to do. And he said, there's some things I can never tell you. He said, I, I will take to my grave. They are completely, um, like completely blacked out. Like we, we can't talk about it. He said, but there's some cool stuff we can talk about. So he, telling me all this stuff. And I, he said, but what you don't understand, he said, that wasn't even our primary job. Department of Treasury primary job is to combat counterfeit bills, counterfeit money. And so we're talking, and um, I said, is that really like an issue in our society? Like, I mean, come on, counterfeit money. Like, you see it on TV, but I've never seen like a briefcase full of fake bills. Anybody here ever got one? If you do, share. I've never, you know, nobody's ever showed up to church one day and said, hey, can you launder this for me? I mean, the answer would be yes, but um, <laughs> absolutely. But, but that's never happened. I mean, devil's had it long enough, but it's, it's never happened. It's never happened. And, but he looked at me, he said, he said, I can tell you this. Every single person in America that has ever handled money has probably handled a counterfeit bill. He said, every person. He said, it is that big of a deal. He said, that's why we have a job. And so he's telling me all these ways that people are counterfeit. I said, how do you keep up with technology and all this stuff that's going on? How in the world do you keep up with all this stuff? He goes, we don't try. I said, well, then how do you do it? He said, we sit down at the original training and every year for, for follow-up training for hours with the original bills. He said, we will sit down with ones, fives, and yes, even twos. 20s, 50s, 100s. He said, we will sit down and we will go over those bills time and time and time and time again. He said, to the point where I can spot a counterfeit before it leaves the person's hand. He said, in fact, when a person pulls a bill out, I can tell by the sound it makes against their thumb if it is real or not. Because we have been so exposed to the truth, we can spot the lie every time listen to me. How do I defeat fear? How do I defeat the deception and lie of the enemy? And how do I defeat hatred? I've got to be exposed so much to what is real, what is true, what is accurate, what is authentic. That when the enemy comes in and says, did God really say? We can say, yes. Here's what God said. So if you're here and you're bound by fear and you're bound by deception or you're bound by hatred, here's what the Bible says. Having done all to stand, stand. In the words of Winston Churchill in the Second World War, World War, never quit, never stop, never give up, never surrender. Fight the good fight of faith. Hang on to what is true. Value it and don't let go of it. Because when the enemy comes in with the three-headed dogs of hell, the three-headed hound of hell, when he comes in and he tries to bring the three weapons that he always uses over and over and over to strike fear into your heart, to try to lie to you and deceive you and tell you God's not going to do what God said he was going to do. And he tries to separate you from the person you're sitting next to right now in these seats because he wants power of agreement to be broken. When that happens, you go back to the truth of the word of God. Stop looking for the lie. Stop looking for what is wrong. Stop looking for how he's going to come next. And look only to the truth. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I don't know where you are in this room right now. Maybe you're here and you're bound by fear right now. Maybe, maybe you're living with the deception of the enemy in your life right now who's telling you it's never going to be, it's never going to happen. God's never going to do what he said. Your kids will never be saved. Your marriage will never be restored. Your life will never be whole. You'll never get out of this sickness. You'll never get to a place where your, your finances are squared away. You're never going to be victorious. You're hearing that over and over in your mind, and you've got to a place where not only you bound by fear, but the enemy is deceiving and lying to you. And every time somebody comes 
in to try to challenge you and help you, there's this offense and there's this hatred that comes in. And it's the same cycle over and over and over and over and over. I want to pray for you today that God will begin to break the cycle. Because the Bible says where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. The Bible says the truth, knowing the truth, knowing the real, knowing the accurate, will set you free. Here's the truth. You have been called. You've been set aside. There's a purpose for your life. There's a plan for your life. I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord. Plans to prosper you, to give you a hope, to give you a future. Every person in this room, you need to grasp onto that with everything you've got before you leave here today. If you are here and you do not know who Jesus is, I want you to pray this simple prayer saying, Jesus, forgive me of my sin. Come into my life. Take over my life. I will follow you for the rest of my life. Allow your spirit to be alive and evident inside of me. Forgive me. Change me. Make me new today. moment, your service pastor, Pastor Daniel, is going to come out here and she's going to share with you some ways that you can be able to let us know that you've made that commitment. You've got a book we're going to give you and that kind of thing. A bunch of announcements, a lot of stuff going on between now and that moment. I want to pray with you. I want to challenge you right now that you would stop and allow God to speak to your life and break the chains and the yokes of the enemy. God, I thank you for every person who is here. I thank you for the blessing and favor that is on their life even though the enemy has told them otherwise and they don't even feel it right now maybe can't see it right now but you have done great things for them you have prepared a way where there is no way you have created wholeness for for their life you've created health for them you've created blessing and favor for them and so god we ask you right now to allow us to walk in those blessings let us no longer fear or be afraid of the drop but let us, God, anticipate the blessing. Let us no longer be lied to by the enemy and deceived by the enemy, but let us realize your truth. And God, I ask you to take every person that is in this room that has separation, that has hatred, that has uh, uh, just the, the, the things that have divided us. God, I ask you to begin to heal those wounds right now. Heal racial wounds. Heal emotional wounds heal physical wounds. God, in Jesus' name, we claim it. Everybody say amen. Come on, give God some praise today.